Welcome to part two of this out of line discussion with Lisa Congdon. I love, I love where we've gone with this. And I I have a few questions that I want to ask you before we wrap. So I know we've already talked about kind of the beginning of your social media and the entry point of Flickr, which is amazing. Um, But I'm wondering what kind of criteria do you use to determine what goes online and what stays private? Do you have any actual boundaries that you kind of check in with? Yeah. I mean, it's sort of vague, but like, it's definitely like if I post this picture or say this thing, am I going to feel super uncomfortable for a long time now, a certain amount of vulnerability or like, um, the Brene Brown, um, calls it like vulnerability hangover. Mm -hmm. Um, when you like do something and then you feel like, um, that sort of uneasiness afterwards, if I, if, if I know that sharing something super personal, is going to make me feel, um, uncomfortable afterwards, then I usually don't, I try to use my own kind of feelings as a gauge. Now I do tell personal story. I'll like write personal essays on my blog and then post about them online. You know, so that's sort of like the level of personal I go to. So I'll talk about in retrospect, I've been struggling with this, this thing, and this is how I'm dealing with it. Or, I went through this hard experience, but I came out on the other side, like Mm. most of, and I've written a few blog posts that have been like, I'm still struggling with this thing and I don't really know how I'm going to get out of it. You know, Um, like workaholism has basically been a running theme in my writing for a long time. And I have really made some huge changes in my life to deal with it. But like for a long time, that's what I was writing about. And that felt like a level of sharing and on something that I thought other people would benefit hearing about or might be interested in. Cause I do think it's something we all struggle with. Um, or that this idea that like, once you become a well-known successful artist, that everything's easy, it actually becomes a bit harder because the, there's a lot of pressure and demand. Mm. And, um, and then the t- I wanted to have real talk about that. So I'm really good at and comfortable with sort of telling those kinds of stories. Now you will never see a picture of me or my feet in the bathtub. Like there's just, for me, there's just a line of like my body even. Okay. Um, and my personal space. I don't post that many pictures of the inside of my house. And you'll see a few more of my studio, but yes, there's definitely lines and I don't have like specific rules, but I think my main rule is like, if I post this, am I going to feel uncomfortable or is it going to feel like an invasion of my own privacy? Okay. Am I going to be inviting something? And, uh, and, and that's pretty much as far as it goes for me. And I have a really strong sense of that now from so many years of like trial and error, Yeah. you know, posting something and then being like, Oh shit, why did I post that? <laughs> and, and actually taking it down or whatever. And I still do that sometimes where like five minutes later, I'm like, no, I shouldn't have said that. Although it's so nice to be able to edit your Instagram captions yes, now. I love that. Now. I know. It's so great. I know. So Yeah. So anyway, I'm, you know, it's, I think for some people they have like very strict rules. Um, for me, it's really just about listening to my intuition about what I'm going to be comfortable with because I'm the one who has to live with it. I'm the one who has to like, you know, read the comments, deal with any reactions or lack of reaction or, you know, whatever that Mm -hmm. might bother me. So, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I love how you said, trial and error. Cause sometimes it, it's not like, Oh, I have this, you know, typed out set of boundaries that I check in with before I post. It's more just like a feeling. Well, like, yeah, you do something, you post something thinking it's going to be fine. And then afterwards you realize it's not. And then you're like, I'm never doing that again. Mm-hmm. You know? And there's some things I'm willing to be uncomfortable around. Like I'm way more comfortable with it now, but right after the election, I was posting a lot of stuff about politics and my views. And it was, I've lost a lot of followers. I've also gained a lot of followers because of it. But Mm. in the beginning, there was a lot of negative comments and a lot of people arguing on my feed. And in that case, I said, this is making me uncomfortable. I don't like it, but I think it's good and important. And Mm. so I'm going to leave it there. And so there are some things I'm willing to sort of like stretch myself for in terms of discomfort or, or, you know, like 
sharing parts of myself that, that other people might not like, you yeah. know, and I think it's worth it in that case. But in some cases it's really, it's stuff is none of people's business. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, snaps for that. And I think, um, like you said about losing followers, but then gaining some, it's kind of the process of strengthening your, I don't, I don't want to say the word brand because that feels weird and yucky when it's you. No, 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 you but, can say brand. Okay. Yeah. But it kind of strengthens your brand because it's, it's people being like, oh, this is what she stands for. And then your followers and also the people who are huge supporters of you, it kind of, it strengthens that because there's something that they can really connect with and identify with that's deeper than just like, I like her art, you know? Well, <laughs> And I think that there's like people who continue to follow me, even though they don't agree with my politics and, or they're like super religious and, you know, might like have trouble with my sexuality. Like they're just people who hang in there with me. And that's also why I continue to say what I say, because I feel like who knows whose hearts or minds we can actually change in just being who we are. Mm. Um, and there are a lot of people who are like, I don't agree with you, but I, I, I think you seem like an amazing person. So I'm going to continue to follow you or whatever. Right. And like, that's kind of also really cool. Um, you know, yeah, it's sort of like being who you are, like <laughs> helps hone your audience for sure. But at the same time, um, I think that challenging long held beliefs, um, is also a way of potentially changing hearts and minds. And, and that's something that, that I want to be able to use my platform to do. So. Yeah. And I, you humanize that, you know, you're not just like in air quotes, like a gay woman. That's so scary yeah. for some people because it is so against everything that they believe. It's suddenly like, Oh, Lisa. Oh, I, I, I like her work. Oh, she's yeah. such a loving woman. And then all of a sudden it humanizes you from just being a scary label that equals fear and kind of a reaction because of beliefs. It's sort of, oh, okay, hang on. This is a real human and I can love who she is and what she stands for. And you're right. Maybe there will be a time where there are hearts and minds that are open and listening and what you have to say and what you stand for will actually really make a difference. Yes. I love that. And actually, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So what do you think would happen if you went off the grid for a while, if you just kind of disappeared from online? I fantasize online? about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do do that periodically. I was doing it regularly this winter and spring. Um, I've done it less Recently, I probably am due for one. Um, I, I mean, like, I'll do it for two or three days, but I've never done it for much longer than that. And um, sometimes I think, oh, well, yeah, exactly. Like, what would happen if I left for two or three weeks or a month? Probably not much. Mm. I think it would cause me a lot of anxiety because so much of my connection every day is online. And I think there's this inherent feel, fear that people are going to forget about us. Mm. Um, but even when I've gone for like a week. I think I went off between Christmas and New Year's this year for seven days or last year, I should say. And I just drew and painted and hung out at my house with my wife and like got cozy. It was really cold here. And, um, it was amazing. And then I came back, of course it had only been seven days and it was just like, Hey everybody, I'm back, you know, and it was kind of fun. And I think that's like, you know, I think the fear is like, even not being online for a day is going to impact or have something bad will happen. When in fact, I think going offline allows you to get back in touch with what really matters in your life. And I notice the days that I don't post, I'm less stressed because I'm not thinking like, Oh, how's that post doing? Or what are people saying about that thing that I just wrote about? Mm. I actually can be more present with other things in my life because I'm not as distracted by, by, you know, interacting with people on social media. And, um, and that's been a big lesson for me to, to just have days where I don't post anything. And, um, and it's actually really freeing and awesome. I'm about to go away, um, this week for four or five days to upstate New York to this retreat. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to take a social media break. Um, like maybe I'll post once or twice, but those situations are 
first of all, there's no internet where I'm going. Mm. I think there must be like 3G. <laughs> I might have get some cell reception, but probably not a lot. So it might even not be possible. And I'm actually really looking forward to it. So, yeah. Um, well, so I, and I know intellectually nothing terrible happens when you take a break. Like the world doesn't, your world won't come falling down because you're off the grid. Um, it's actually really good for you, I think. And I, it's something that I have started to practice more of and want to get better at practicing more of. Mm. Well, that's, I'm, I'm watching. I want to, I want to learn <laughs> from you. So report back on that. Um, but I love that. I, I know I mentioned to you that I'm super stoked that Cat Footwear is partnering with me for my very first year of podcasting. And one of the things that both Kat and I share in valuing is um, being really bold in creativity. So I've always loved how you allow your work, like we've talked about this a little bit, even about your, you using your artwork and also your platform as a, as a space to talk about politics a little bit. I've always loved how that feels really genuine when you do that. It's not like a sudden separation from your work, like, okay, now I'm going to get political. So how do you boldly create work that stands for something without it feeling forced? Well, I think in my case, like, first of all, I've been kind of making political work for years. I, especially around like DOMA and marriage equality, like I've been kind of speaking out about that publicly for a long time. And I also, did some work for both the Obama campaign and the Hillary campaigns. Um, I was hired by the campaigns to do artwork for both of them. And so that was a huge honor for me. And, you know, I shared that stuff publicly. And um, I think as a gay woman, like people sort of might expect me to, you know, it's easier for me than I think is for some people to just sort of come out and start making more political work. But what I also think is true is that I do, and I think this is true for a lot of people, I do have deeply held um, beliefs about inclusion and diversity and love and social justice. And I've been sort of working, in fact, my career before I even became an artist was very heavily steeped in, in that work. And so this is something that's kind of in my blood. And so making artwork that expresses my, you know, desire for what I think a good world would look like and how the current administration is, you know, working against a lot of the things I believe in mm. doesn't come that hard to me. Like I, it, it was flowing out of me for a while. Like in January and February, I was just like on a roll <laughs> because I was so, ch because I was so emotional and, ch and angry and sad and like, and also inspired by the women's March and so much of the activism that was happening. And so it just kind of flew out of, you know, kind of literally flowed out of me mm. now like with anything you get burned out. Right. Yeah. Um, like we were talking about earlier, it's hard to like continue to read the news every day or even be on social media every day. It's like, it was really exciting and kind of empowering at first, but then, you know, I think there's a lot of like, burnout that happens and fatigue around activism. And I certainly experienced that too, but I try to remind myself that that's a privilege, right? Like I have to stand back up and, and keep spreading the word about stuff that I care about. Um, and, uh, and I do it in a, you know, in my artistic style, I do it in the way that, and I'm lucky I, um, became a hand letterer about six or seven years ago. Like I really started focused on hand lettering. So I really can very quickly make art that has a message hmm. that because it's just words. And so that's been another vehicle for me is just like, quoting other people or saying what I want to say just in words, which takes me like five minutes as opposed to making an entire painting in my sketchbook that is, you know, has a political message, but is illustrated, you know, which takes much more time and energy. And so that's, I feel like has been really helpful for me that, you know, I can use these like skills that I have mm. to spread messages pretty, pretty quickly and easily on Instagram mm. in particular. Yeah. I love it. I love it so much. So thank you for, thank you for, I often, I, yeah, I often, when something happens, I, I often go like, what's Lisa posting? Cause it's always going to be, <laughs> it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be, it's going to be, <laughs> it'll have a strong message and be beautiful, which is like the ultimate. So thanks for standing yeah. for that. Um, okay. Last two questions. 
What's something that you think and feel that you have in common with every single human on the planet? I think I touched on this a little earlier, but, but I think that one thing we forget that we have in common, not just me, but that we have in common, that everybody has in common is that we all feel pain. Um, and that's a really powerful thing. So do you know that show on, it's on ABC, it's called, this is us. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Mm Yeah. Okay. So I started watching that on Netflix and you know, in many ways, it's sort of a contrived cheesy drama. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons I love that show is that every single character on that show has pain. There isn't one person who's got it together. Even the person who you think is the one who's got it together is, or should have it together is dealing with some internal pain about who they are or a choice they made or whatever. And as I was watching the first season of that series, that was the thing that just really impacted me was like this idea that, that, that like we literally all have pain, no matter how beautiful somebody is, no matter how talented, how successful we all experience like hardship and, and it's actually understanding that and remembering that that actually helps us to be more compassionate towards people mm. and to bond with people, especially people we might disagree with or who we might not be attracted to as human beings. Um, initially it's like one thing we all have in common, like everybody experiences pain and, um, and I always try to remember that because, because like we were saying earlier, it's so easy to, especially with social media, to just imagine that people have perfect lives and are incredibly happy. And I think there are a lot of people with great lives who are very happy out there. <laughs> and that's awesome. Mm-hmm. But even those people have struggles. And I think that's something we all have in common, something that it's important not to forget. Mm, I love that one. Yes, 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 and yes. I love that one. Thank you. Um, so last question, what, um, what is your favorite self-care activity? What do you do when you need to just take care of yourself and feel, <laughs> feel healthy and well? Um, I am notoriously or historically terrible at self-care. Um, but <laughs> one of my, <laughs> one of my, um, goals in the last year as I've been trying to like, um, deal with my sort of history as a workaholic, um, and heal that part of myself who feels like I have to be working at a frenetic pace and, um, that I'm not sort of don't have time to relax and enjoy myself or I sort of forgot in some ways how to do that. Like I've really been working on that. And so even now, and I have a lot of projects and a lot of deadlines and a lot of you know, I feel a lot of pressure sometimes when I wake up in the morning, like I got to, I mean, of course it's stuff I all, it's all stuff I signed up for, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So that's an important part of my equation is just remembering like you chose this Lisa. So, <laughs> yep. but I give myself permission to just take time off. I have this really wonderful schedule that I have full control of. And for uh, about a year and a half, I had an employee who worked for me about 75% of the time. And and she left to go to another job a few months ago. And that in some ways even freed me up more to have a super flexible schedule. Cause I wasn't needing to be around my employee or make sure that she was busy and had stuff to do. So it's like, I have one less person sort of working on stuff for me, but, um, I also have this amazingly flexible schedule. So I do things like take afternoons off. Um, I get a massage every two weeks. Mm. And I have for many years, I go to acupuncture every two weeks. Um, and instead of, and so I I'm getting better at like when I feel depressed or anxious or stressed out or overwhelmed, getting better at stopping and just taking time off and going and having some tea somewhere or like going and walking through a thrift store or just um, reading a book or whatever I feel like doing, like just stopping work for a while and knowing that I'll get back to it and I'll still meet my deadlines that taking time off is actually really important. That just because I have an eight hour day doesn't mean I have to fill it with work Mm. that I can actually do other things. Um, and then I also build in these sort of regular things into my schedule that I have to look forward to. 
um, like massage and acupuncture. Um, I'm really into walking in my neighborhood every single day. I, I take my dog for a walk and that sounds, doesn't sound like self care, but it, but it getting out, especially in the middle of summer is so important. Um, and just moving your body because like so many days I, I literally just sit still all day at my computer or drawing table mm. and, uh, and, and we, and so no wonder we're anxious and depressed, right? right. Like we haven't even been outside. Right. So just remembering to go outside or like, sometimes I'll be like, I'm going to take myself out to lunch today. So these are things I never, ever did before, but that I'm doing so much more of now. And, um, and guess what? Like I'm still getting my work done in some ways. I'm more productive. Last week, my best friend was in town and I took pretty much, I only worked probably about 30% of what I normally would have worked. And so I had to work over the weekend to sort of make up for it a little bit, but I had so much energy on Saturday to write this book that I'm working on because I had taken all this time off. And I think I made so much more progress in one day than I might have made the entire week if I had tried to sort of do it piecemeal. So Mm. sometimes taking time off, just taking care of yourself actually helps you be more productive. Yeah. Kind of letting, it's almost like your, your creative muscle or brain is a literal muscle that almost needs to heal so that fresh blood can go there. And so that when you use it again, it's kind of like you don't work out the same muscles every single day, seven days in a row, or else you get an injury. And so it's almost like, yeah, I I love that sometimes changing my routine and then coming back, it is kind of like, whoa, cool. Look at all this stuff coming out. This is amazing. I like this more than I've liked my work for a while. I love that. That's a really good one. Yeah, it is. It's like you, in some ways, stopping and not making work for a while, actually, when you go back to making it, you just feel like you're getting a fresh start where it can feel really muddy if you're just constantly trying to be creative. So that's another really important reason just to take time off, period. Mm, Thank you for that. That's a great reminder. (laughs) I love it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for being here today. And thanks for being so honest and, and candid about so many amazing topics. And I can't wait. When does your when does your book come out? The one that you were talking about with the women? So it's October 1st, I think. Um, and it's called A Glorious Freedom. And if people follow me on Instagram, you'll hear me talking about it a bit. Um, I think it's also on sale on Amazon already. I mean, for pre-order. And then if you're listening to this after October, 2017, it'll already be for sale. But, um, but it's just a book about older women who are, um, who has, some of them are still alive and people I interviewed who are doing really amazing things, either athletic feats or did amazing things at an older age or are continuing to work at an older age, um, and contribute to society in really astounding ways. And then some of the writing in the book is about women from history who didn't get a start until later in life, like our late bloomers as, as we call them. And, um, there are also some essays in the book by women over 40 about the, the struggles and joys of getting older. So, mm. um, wow. So yeah, I can't wait. Um, I can't wait to get that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so, that's really amazing. Thank you so much for creating that, sure. that gift sure. for us. I can't wait to snag it and, uh, give it to lots of people as gifts, I'm sure. So thank you so much. And, um, we will be talking soon. I'm sure. Yes. Thank you, Caroline. Bye Lisa. Bye. You've been listening to Out of Line with Caroline Lee. Tweet me at Team Woodnote or tag me in your posts on Instagram using Out of Line Podcast and let me know what you thought of today's discussion and who you'd like to hear as a guest on Out of Line next. This episode of Out of Line was produced by me, Caroline. All sound editing, engineering, and original music composition by Jaden Lee. And a big thank you to Cat Footwear for working with Out of Line this season. Hit subscribe to get the next episode on your mobile device when it drops next week. And if you love what you heard, please whip out a review, will ya?